Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. <clears throat> this is from Joshua's uh, farewell address, I guess you could say. It's become a kind of a famous passage for Christians. Joshua 24, let's see, let's begin reading in verse 14. Joshua's given a challenge to Israel here at the end of his life. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Now think about that verse just for a minute. He says, Put away the gods which your father served. Now remember where we are. They have just now come out of the land of Egypt, come through the wilderness for 40 years. They've gotten into the promised land. They've spent about 30 years conquering and occupying and taking over that land. And he's telling them to put away the gods which their fathers served. You mean they still have some of those gods then? I bet I'm talking to a Baptist tonight that spent about 30 years trying to live for the Lord here and there and try to be generally in fellowship with him. And the truth of the matter there is that there's still some of the world's gods hanging on to, to us. <laughs> some of these world's pictures and some of the world's loves and some of the world's entertainment and some of the world's philosophy and some of the world's junk <laughs> is hanging on to us, isn't it? We sit and look at them pictures and listen to that junk till it has permeated our minds. And even though we're generally God's people, and don't get me wrong, I'm not beating you up, I'm, I'm very much in your number here, I assure you. We're still, we still have to be told to go put away some gods. Amen. 30 years later, that's a shame. It gets even worse as I continue to read. Verse 15, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went. Uh, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Now what do you think Joshua said to that? Oh, bless you children, I'm so glad you've chosen the right side. Look at Joshua's reply, verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he has done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. No, they're, they're arguing back and forth here. They're saying, Oh, don't worry, we're going to serve the Lord. Then how come I just had to tell you to put away those gods? You cannot serve the Lord. Oh, yes, we will. Or I mean, no. We really will, verse 21, nay, but we will serve the Lord. Verse 22, and Joshua said unto the people, ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. When you make a commitment, God holds you accountable to that commitment. It has become popular in recent days to say, oh, you can't hold me responsible for that. I was young and didn't know what I was saying. When I was uh, eight or nine years old, I surrendered to ministry. I said, I'll be a missionary or a pastor or an evangelist or whatever you tell me, Lord, I'm going to preach your word. I did that at eight or nine years old. I admit there were some ways I didn't know what I was doing, but I meant business about it, and apparently God took it. He does hold them accountable. And Joshua says, okay, you're witnesses. You said it, especially if you're an adult. Verse 23. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which, look at it, are among you. They're sitting there having church saying goodbye to Joshua in one of the most memorable meetings they'll ever have in their whole lives. 
And they've got false gods among them right then at that moment. And he has to tell them, get rid of that cell phone out of your pocket right now. Amen. Isn't that something? That's the way we are. Verse 24, and the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in check. All right, of course, we're going to take our text from the famous passage back in verse 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to preach tonight. Choose today. Choose today. There's probably somebody still, maybe under the sound of my voice, maybe on a recording, that needs to make a choice that they've been putting Amen. on a long time. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us as we try to preach this passage, Lord, and I pray you help us to learn the importance of it. And dear God, there's some people that probably need to make a decision that are hearing my voice, and Lord, I pray that you'd help them to do it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to say this, you can and should choose the master of your life. Now, you can't choose whether or not you're going to be a slave. I got bad news for you. You already are, always have been, and always will be a slave. Somebody is your master. Good you're morning. either serving the devil, you're serving the world, peer pressure, your flesh, your own selfish desires, some oppressor that is uh, running, dictating your life like they do in communist countries or preferably God, but somebody is calling the shots in your life. Amen, that's a good point. You have no choice in that matter, but you do have this choice. You can choose who it is. Now that you can choose. God will let you choose. Do you want to serve your dictator? Do you want to serve your husband or your wife? Do you want to serve your boss? Do you want to serve um, popular trends? Do you want to serve what your flesh tells you to do? There are some people, but if their flesh tells them to get another bite of food, they're going to get another bite of food come hell or high water. <laughs> there are some people, if their flesh tells them to lay in the bed another hour, they're going to lay in the bed another hour regardless of any other factor in the world. Their flesh totally runs their lives. There are other people, carnal desires run their lives. There are other people, whatever makes the next dollar runs their lives. But there is something that totally runs your life, and you can choose and say, you know what? Something is going to run my life. I'm going to make sure it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to make sure it's God. Now, that you can choose. That you can. And you should. Now, this is a very famous test, text, part of Joshua's farewell address to the nation. They're already in the promised land. They've already nearly completely subdued it at this point. And he commands Israel, and his commands had gotten them to the promised land, to fear the Lord, to serve him sincerely, and put away other gods. And I'm going to say this. As your pastor, I command you tonight to fear the Lord, serve him sincerely, and put away other gods. If you don't do it, you're disobeying what the Scripture clearly says. Amen. There's no doubt what the Scripture says about this. There are some things that there is room for disagreement about in the Bible. There is. Good men disagree on some of the details, on some of the complicated doctrines. I make no doubt about that. I, I don't try to deny that. There have been things that as I've studied over the years, I've changed my position and it's pretty difficult. I, I, I'm just not sure. But whether or not God Almighty ought to be ruling over your life, any sort of reading of the Bible, you'll have to agree that's what should be happening. Yeah. And if he is not who you are serving, you are not having the blessed life that you should have, and you're not having the victory that you should have. Now, Joshua sensed that some would hesitate to obey. So he made an allowance in verse 15 that has become a famous verse to us. He says, if it seems evil to serve the Lord, then choose another God today and start serving. The Lord can do something more with somebody that is busy doing something wrong than he can with somebody that's sitting on the couch and can't make a decision. Good I've heard people before getting all nervous and knowing something needed to be done and couldn't exactly figure out what. They had what we sometimes call paralysis by analysis 
where they sit and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and never could make a decision and never could get started. And after a while, they got nervous and said, I've got to get up and do something if it's wrong. <laughs> you know, that's actually not real bad advice. You get up and get busy, and God will start directing you. That's correct. Um, Paul and Barnabas, you know, started to go into, or was it Silas by that time? Paul and whoever his companion was at the moment started to go someplace, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him go. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't have said a cotton-picking thing to them if they'd have been sitting at home. It was because they were up and going that the Holy Spirit directed them and said, No, don't go into Asia. No, don't go over here either. Go west. Thank God it came to Europe and got to me and you because of that. But be that as it may, um, the servant of Abraham said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. You get up and start going somewhere if it's wrong, and God will direct you. But he does not direct a couch sitter. He does not correct, uh, direct a pew sitter. Amen. It's just not who he directs. Now, he might give you some blessing. He might comfort your heart in a, in a time of weakness. But the busier you get for him, the more direction you get. You ever get confused and think, I'll tell you, I just don't know if I should do this or this, if I should move here or here, if I should take this job or that job, marry this sweetheart or that sweetheart, invest this way or that way. You get some decisions in life, let me tell you how you get answers. Get busy. Amen. Start doing something. And God says, okay, now there's an active person. I'll give it. Listen. When he called Elisha, he was plowing a field with yoke and yoke of oxen. You know what he was doing? He was busy doing what he should do. When he called David, you know what David was doing? Tending sheep like his daddy had him doing. You know what God did? Told him something. You fix him to be king, son. When he called the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, you couldn't be more wrong than the Apostle Paul. Amen. He was persecuting men and women and throwing them in jail and even killing a few of them, or at least going along with killing a few of them just because they were Christians, and God said, there's an industrious man, I can use him. And a dang old terrorist, he turns over to his side. But you know who he doesn't call? Somebody who's sitting there. That's right. <laughs> when Gideon, when Gideon needed guidance from the Lord, Gideon was over there threshing wheat in secret, trying to get some food for his family that the Midianites wouldn't steal, because they had them in oppression at that time, and the Lord sent an angel and said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon was a kind of a coward, just to tell you the truth. He's scared to death to make a move. But I'll tell you what he was. He was busy. When he called Moses and he appeared to him in that burning bush, Moses was leading flocks way out in the wilderness, out in the boondocks, as we might say. But I'll say this for him. He was busy. You need an answer to something you've been praying about? Get Busy and watch God guide and direct. But he does say this. He says, choose you a God and start serving if it seems evil to serve the Lord. This reminds me of the Lord's rebuke of Laodicea for their lukewarmness. He said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Good point. All right, so let's, let's expound this uh, verse here just for a few minutes. And we'll be done. All right? The first phrase is, if it seem evil unto you. Now, that's a strange thing for a man of God to say, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. So let's talk about why in the world would he say that? Well, sometimes it seems evil to people to serve the Lord because of authority. They just hate authority. There is something in the heart of most of us, just a rebellious streak, that when somebody just comes up and takes the authority and, and tells us the way it should be, it just kind of rubs us wrong in our old flesh and our old carnal natures. I, I think most of us have felt that from time to time, sometimes quite often. Mark 1.22, let me tell you about our Lord Jesus. He came across with authority. Mark 1.22 says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. The scribes sounded like academics, bless their heart. They didn't sound like they had any authority. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, uh, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Let me tell you what Jesus Christ says. He says, All power, it's mine. If you want help, I can give it to you. If you don't get it from me, you can't get any. He told his disciples in another place, Without me, ye can do nothing. That's right. 
Bible says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were ignorant and unlearned men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. A man that has been with Jesus is bold because they know good and well what Jesus just said to them. When they get real timid and shy and passive, they ain't been around Jesus. Jesus' followers are not timid nor shy nor passive. I don't mean that they don't have different personality types. I don't mean that. I don't mean that some aren't more quiet and some aren't more boisterous and all that sort of thing. What I do mean is when it comes to telling you what God said, they don't hold back because they know it because they spend time with him and you can tell it when they pray and you can tell it when they preach and you can tell it when they just read the Bible. Bible says Gee, all Jesus did was just read the scripture sitting down and gave the book back to the minister and every eye in the place was on him. There was something about it, just the way he read the scripture that got all their attention. You know when somebody spent time with God and one thing they are not is they're not shy because they know what they just heard was from God. Therefore, they come with all authority from him. All right, so it seems evil unto some people because of the authority that comes from him. That rubs some people. That's just too, um, I don't know, Presumptuous, presumptuous, maybe they think. Maybe some of them think it's too masculine. Maybe some of them just uh, don't want to be bossed. I don't know. But one reason is because of the authority that comes from the Lord. All right, another one is because of the trials that will come from the Lord. I hate to tell you this. If you start serving the Lord, you will notice an increase in the trials in your life. That's a fact, amen. I wish I could tell you now, if you'll just get right with God, all of a sudden they'll roll out the red carpet, somebody will hand you a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates, and you'll be so happy. I wish I could tell you that. I do get quite a bit of chocolate, serving the Lord, but other than that, you don't get much. <laughs> but I will say this. Those trials are offset by the joys that the Lord gives. Now, you will notice the trial. You, you will not be able to miss it. You will not get serious about serving the Lord and go, hmm, boy, it, doesn't, it never seems like a trial ever hits me. That will not be your experience, I'm sorry to tell you. And because some trials will come, some people think that it's evil to serve the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what that verse just said? The trial of your faith is much more precious than of gold. Wow. So if God sends you a trial, he is sending you something much more precious than if he loaded you down with a bunch of gold. That's good. Problem is, you don't really realize that in many cases until the judgment seat. And then at the appearing of Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden you get it. But right now you don't see it that way. It takes the eye of faith to just trust and obey. Job, when he was going through his trial, had no idea that the latter end of him was going to be blessed more than the first. I mean, he was already the richest man in that whole part of the world. And yet, the Lord doubled a lot of his blessings. He couldn't see that. All he knew is he's going through a trial. Christian, now that takes some faith. Next time you're going through a trial, next time there's a heartbreak, next time there's a disappointment, can you remember and can you believe that the trial you're going through is much more precious than gold that perisheth? Oh, that'll test your faith, won't it? <laughs> That's what the book says. All right, if it seem evil unto you, for some people because of authority, for some people because of trials, here's a good one, for some people because of punishment. Now, the truth of the matter is you're not perfect, and good as your heart may be, and as good as your intentions may be, when you start serving the Lord, you're going to mess up and you're going to sin. And the Lord is a just God, so he's going to send some punishments your way. Not just trials to help grow you, but just, hey, you didn't do what I said. Quack, 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 and give you a little spanking spiritually speaking, of course. And uh, those punishments are going to make you bitter. There are some people that get bitter because of that. 
when either a punishment or a trial comes, as we've said before, you can choose one of two roads. You can either get bitter or you can get better. That, that's the only two choices you get. You can decide, am I going to let this get a root of bitterness in my heart or am I going to let it make me better? The Bible says by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Hebrews 12, I think we quoted this this morning. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So sometimes it seems evil to serve the Lord because of the punishment that will come. Uh, sometimes it seems evil to serve the Lord because of the sacrifice. There are some things you will have to give up. There are some things that will cost you. If you get serious about serving the Lord, you'll want to give a 10% of your income. Most um, orthodox Bible teachers teach. You know why? Because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, that strange character that showed up back in the Old Testament before the law. You know what Jacob did? He promised to tithe back before the law. Yes. You know what's mentioned in Hebrews after the law? The tithe. That's true. You know what you want to do? You, you'll want to support God's work. I'm not saying that because I'm after money. I'm well taken care of. I have no personal uh, motive in this whatsoever. I'm saying it for your good. Amen. The Lord will bless you taking care of him and his work. He'll bless that. It is a, is a blessing to him that somebody cares enough to give. Then over and above that, as you know our teaching on these things, we give to the Lord's ministry, to the missionaries out in foreign countries. It doesn't have anything to do with Victory Baptist Church in Crossville, Tennessee. It is supporting God's work, whether it's planting churches in other places in America or in other places in the world. Over and above the tithe, we give to that. You say, well, I can't imagine giving 10% of my income. Well, how about... 15 or 20 once you count giving some to missions. I can't imagine that. Again, we don't report to anybody how much anybody gives. I personally don't even know. I'm not the treasurer. Don't ever even see that stuff. I'm not saying that for any personal reason. I'm saying because of how God has blessed me when I do that. And because of all the testimonies I've heard of other people. That's but money point. isn't the only way that you'll sacrifice. And it may not be as much in money. You may be in a situation where for one reason or another you got other things going. I don't know. But I know this. If you serve God, you will sacrifice. When uh, David realized his sin and his mistake was part of what was bringing punishment on Israel, he went to purchase a piece of property so he could offer up a sacrifice to the Lord who had just stopped the judgment. And this is what he says. When uh, he goes to buy it from a man named Arana, Arana says, Wow, what is this between you here? You can have it. And David said this, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. When you love somebody, it doesn't bother you in the least to sacrifice for them. It makes you feel good. There was an old slow soft rock song when I was a kid growing up that said, it's no sacrifice. Meaning, they love this person so much it was no sacrifice. Many people have told stories of when they were getting together with their sweetheart and they were dating if they sacrificed a little bit to take care of their sweetheart, how glad they were to do it. All of us who are parents are very familiar with this. It is no sacrifice. If our money is spent and it's spent on our children, amen, that's what it's for. I've, I've actually used those words. Sometimes my kids have said, boy, Dad, I'm sorry you're spending a lot of money on me. I said, honey, that's what my money's for. <laughs> I wouldn't want my money to do anything else but taking care of my kids. And you know what? You ought to feel that way about God. Whether yeah. it's your money or your time or your efforts or your heart desire or your health or whatever you've got to give him, that's what it's for is for him. And that ought to be a blessing to you to try to serve him. But there are those who don't want to serve God because of the sacrifice that it includes. And it doesn't include some sacrifice. Sometimes it's because of impatience. <laughs> now, I've never not wanted to serve God because of impatience, but 
but I have gotten mad at him a few times because of impatience. He does not do things on my schedule. <laughs> More than once I've said, Lord, you said you was going to do that. Why aren't you doing that? <laughs> and he, he was going to do it and did do it. But he didn't do it at all when I wanted him to. There's been times I made a mistake and I understood I needed some punishment. I needed to learn some things before I went back and tried that thing again. And I thought it should take, you know, two or three months. <laughs> and he decided to let it go several years. And that made me so mad. And yes, I admit, I knew he was right the whole time that I couldn't be okay with him taking as long as he did to do some of the stuff I wanted him to do a whole lot quicker. <laughs> but you know what? I still know I want to serve God. And there's some people that because it takes a while, they just quit. Let's read a famous passage from the book of Luke over in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. All right, now when it says and not to faint, that implies you're dealing with a pretty long period of time. You keep on going until you're just... You just fall out <laughs> till you faint. And sometimes in your relationship with God, you're going to have to keep going till you faint. And I hate it. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman used to talk about these things and talk about how he was training those guys when he was a drill instructor. And they'd go and go and go, and the sweat would be running, and they'd be out of breath, and they'd some of them finally fall out and drop the rifle they were carrying, you know, and it'd make a distinctive sound on the ground. And he remember what it sounded like. And he'd go up to that guy that went and went and went until he couldn't go anymore and couldn't help it and fall out. And Dr. Ruckman would always say the same thing over him. He'd say, you see that? There's a good man worth more money. He went until he couldn't go any further. He went until he fell on his face. Of course, he was a lost, drunk fornicator back in those days, but he still remembered those days and saying, look, he's a good man. He went till he fell on his face. But later he got saved, and he got reading his Bible, and he got reading about the Lord Jesus with his disciples that night in Gethsemane and how he was sweating blood. And it said about Jesus this. It said, and he went a little further and fell on his face. And the Lord reminded him, said, you remember when you was a drill instructor and you drilling those guys and drilling those guys and they'd come to him and say, Lieutenant, I bet he bet he's sick. <laughs> you know? And he'd throw up and fall over and pass out and all that stuff. He said, you remember what it looks like when somebody goes until they fell on their face? Let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus did that for you even before he died for you. He went a little further and fell on his face. Now there will be times that the Lord is going to let something go longer than you wish it would go. And it'll go all the way to <laughs> You fall on your face, figuratively speaking, if not literally. But nevertheless, back to Luke 18. And he spake a parable unto them this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. This guy just worried about what he wanted. He didn't worry about God. He didn't worry about what any other people thought. Verse 3, And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said, with, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Some people, because of impatience, they just get tired. They said, I talked to the Lord about that. I talked to him about it probably ten times. <laughs> well, it may take a lot longer than that. But I'll say this. When he comes back, is he going to find you still full of faith? All right, so because of authority, because of trials, because of punishment, because of sacrifice, because of impatience, it may seem evil to some people to serve the Lord. So I want to ask you. Does it seem evil to you to, for example, magnify the Lord Jesus? Does it seem evil to you to stand for the Bible and its teachings, especially on hell and the second coming? You know, that's the two you don't ever bring. Oh, man, you don't bring up hell. <laughs> You'd be surprised at the church pew sitting Christians that would get offended if you say much about hell. Yeah. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ said more about hell than any other Bible character? <laughs> Jesus didn't think it was a bad idea to talk about hell. 
um, and the second coming and the Lord coming back and setting up his kingdom and taking over well, that, that, those, are the, those are the messages that are important to Jesus those are the messages that all be important to us but does it seem evil to magnify the Lord Jesus to stand for the Bible to maintain separation there are some people it seems evil to maintain separation from this dirty messed up world we don't maintain separation because we're better than the world. We maintain separation so we can help up the world out of the quicksand that they're in and let's not get stuck in the same mess they're in. That's why we maintain separation. As soon as you start, start talking about, well, now we're going to live separate from that stuff, somebody says, oh, you think you're better than them? <laughs> no, we're familiar with the mud hole they're in. We used to be in it ourselves. <laughs> We are not any better than them, but we're just trying to pull them up out of that rather than dive down into it and get stuck again ourselves. Maintain separate. Does it seem evil to you to be faithful to your family and to the church? Surely that doesn't seem evil to you. All right, the second phrase, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. All right, now what does the Bible tell us about serving the Lord? I said earlier, you're going to have to serve somebody. Yeah, best idea is for it to be the Lord. All right, when you serve the Lord, you're going to serve him with sacrifice. We already mentioned this a little bit. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 33, he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. When do they serve? After they made some sacrifice. There will be some things you give up. 1 Thessalonians 1 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You know when they turn to God? When they turned away from their idols. You know when you will not return to God? As long as you keep worshiping your idols. Amen. As long as you're turned this way, bow down to them, you will not turn that way and bow down to God. You will leave the idols when you turn to God. That's just the truth of it. That's just the way that it works. Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and man. It'll be, uh, it'll be a sacrificial service. Um, uh, here's another one. To serve the Lord, you'll serve him submissively. Oh, boy, that's a problem. Boy, if I hear again how self-made men don't need anybody else, how strong and independent women don't need anybody else, I think I'm going to throw up. Jesus said that is the opposite of the truth. Yes, right. Jesus said, without me, ye can do not as much as you want. <laughs> without me, ye can do only a little. Without me, ye can do nothing. You are not a self-made man. You are not a strong and independent woman. You are 100% dependent on the grace and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the world tells you any differently, they're trying to damn you or destroy you. Do not fall into the world's teaching. They will give you what they used to call a bone steer, for sure. Go with the Word of God. If you serve God, it will have to be submissively. You'll have to say, Amen. Yes, Lord, speak for thy servant here. It will take a great humility in the presence of God. All right, if you want to serve the Lord, I'll tell you how you'll serve him in New Testament times is in the gospel. Is that not true? Romans chapter 1, verse 9, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. If you're serving God and you don't have anything to do with the gospel and you don't help spread the gospel and you don't support preachers who preach the gospel and you couldn't care less about talking about and uh, singing about and giving testimony about the gospel, you're not serving him in the New Testament way. The New Testament way is wrapped up in the spreading of the gospel. That's what our pattern, the Apostle Paul said, about serving. Hebrews 9, 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What's in the context of serving the, live of, lo, the living God? The blood of Christ. The gospel. 
If you serve the Lord, it'll be with sacrifice, it'll be submissively, it'll be in the gospel. Here's a good one. If you serve the Lord, it will be with all your heart. Deuteronomy Amen. 10 12. Israel, what doth the Lord God, the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. You know, when somebody really is doing something with all their heart, we say they put their heart into it. If you serve the Lord God and you serve him at all correctly, your heart is into it. I remember when uh, we got on the radio and Miss Laura was helping me get some things worked out with that and we finally got it on there even before I know for sure that we'd even been on there and certainly before I was hearing all the feedback from it. I just rejoiced because that was something I've been wanting to do literally for decades. Literally for decades. I even thought about changing to radio and TV major at Bob Jones just because I always, I just always felt like the Lord wanted me somehow, some way on the radio and I, I just didn't know how to do it. And when all of a sudden I was going to be able to do it, man, I was rejoicing. I was singing and shouting in the car. You would think I was a crazy man. And then sure enough, I started getting all the feedback and hearing about that sort of thing. You know what I do? I do that with my heart. Yeah. It brings me joy to do that, to think that we're getting the gospel out and we're getting little snippets out of the word of God yeah. in a place that, in, in a time that it's not heard the way it used to be. 1 Samuel 12, 20 says, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Isn't that a good verse? Once in a while, you're going to look back at your life, and you're going to say, man, I've done quite a bit of wickedness. And you know what we can say, based on the scripture, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You know how to put a cure on your all the wickedness you've done? Start serving God with all your heart. And you Amen. know what he'll do? Bless. He didn't call you to serve him and forget, oh, I forgot you're a bad sinner. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that. No, he knew it when he called you. You know what he wants you to do? Serve with all your heart and watch the blessings come. Serve the Lord with sacrifice, submissively in the gospel with all your heart. Now, here's an important thing. Don't forget this. You need to serve him with fear. You need to remember he's a big, powerful God. He can inflict and does inflict damage on people. The Apostle Paul talked about some people that are asleep, meaning they're dead in the grave because of some things they've done to God. He does do that. That is a part of his personality. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 28, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. If you're going to serve God, you need to serve him with some fear. Psalm 211, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Uh, if that's just a reverential trust, why are their knees knocking? Why are they shaking? Because <laughs> it's real fear. Amen. You do need to serve him with some fear. Uh, here's a good one. Oh, I, I don't know why I even waste my time in a Baptist church saying this, but it's in the Bible, so I better say it. When you serve him, you need to serve him with unity in correct doctrine. You need to get with some people you agree with. Avoid to get a bunch of Baptists in agreement. Boy, you, <laughs> buddy, I just gave you a big assignment there, but be that as it may, do your best to serve him that way. Romans 16 says, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Look out when a Baptist comes along that gives good words and fair speeches so everybody will love. That's it. true. That is somebody that is not interested in serving the Lord. That's somebody who is interested in being popular. You know what our pattern, the Apostle Paul in the church age was, was not? He was not popular. There were people that said, oh, he is weak in bodily presence, and his speech is contemptible. But you know what he did have? He had the power of God. And there were much more resonant speakers and much better looking men and people that you would have followed ten times more to have good business contacts and have clout in that day politically. But Paul had the Spirit of God on him. Different thing. 
You'll need to serve him in unity in correct doctrine. Because as soon as everybody's trying to get a big, a big crowd, not based on doctrine, but based on their good words and fair speeches, you're not dealing with somebody trying to serve the Lord. But maybe this is the most important thing. Serve the Lord for blessing. Exodus 23, 25, Ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Exodus 23. Psalm 100, verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. You know what's missing in a lot of Bible-believing Baptist churches? Gladness and loud-spirited singing. You ought to be spirited and happy in your service of God. That's one thing that he gives you. John 12, 26. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, I know my congregation here tonight, and I think if most of you, if Donald Trump gave you a big honor, you'd go, oh, man, Donald Trump gave me a big honor. What did God Almighty gives you an honor. Amen. If uh, some of you had a Super Bowl ring where you had played on a football team that won the Super Bowl, you'd show that to a couple of people. Oh, yeah. Them. What if you get a crown at the judgment seat of Christ? Any man serve me, him will my father honor. Colossians 3.24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. If you had a real rich daddy that left you a big inheritance, that'd be a pretty good blessing, wouldn't it? What if you get an inheritance from the creator of the universe that owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine? What if you got an inheritance from him? When ye serve the Lord Christ, it is of the Lord ye were served. You receive the reward of the inheritance. Wow. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, then here's what you do. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he gives them some choices. He says you can choose some false gods like the ancient gods or the modern gods. There's plenty of modern gods. Oh, yeah. There's some ancient gods. Uh, but here's what you need to do. You need to decide for yourself. Somebody else can't make this decision for you. You need to decide who you're going to put on the throne in your heart. Now, when you consider this, you better consider it spiritually. At first, you know, let's serve whoever pleases my flesh. Yeah, well, here's the problem. Your flesh is going to get sick. Your flesh is going to get old. Your flesh is going to die. So you better consider it spiritually if you're going to have any lasting, permanent benefit from it. Here's another thing. You need to consider it honestly. Here in the Bible Belt, we get good at faking things in church, don't we? We can smile and shake somebody's hand and say something about the Lord when we hadn't thought about the Lord for four days. <laughs> when it comes to deciding who's really on the throne in our heart, we need to get honest. Amen. Because that's not something to convince me of or another church member of or a family member of. That's something between you and God. It does no good to try to fool him. He can look right through your eyeballs into your brain and see every <laughs> thought you're thinking and feel every emotion that you're feeling and see every hidden deed that you do and hear every hidden word that you ever speak. You may as well just cut the fakery with him and say, Lord, here is who I'm putting on the throne of my heart. And if it's Taylor Swift, just tell him. He knows anyway. And if it's your favorite football team, just tell him. He knows anyway. And if it's whoever's paying your paycheck, just tell him. He knows anyway. But be honest about it. Tell him who you're putting on the throne of your heart. And here's another thing. It says choose you this day. You need to decide today. There's a lot of Christians sitting in a lot of church pews that just kind of generally, I mean, they're saved and they just kind of generally want to do good, but they haven't really made a decision. And they just kind of do some good and then they kind of do some world and they kind of do some spiritual and they kind of do some flesh and they kind of send out a little bit of gospel, but then they'll kind of send out some filth to try to get some laughs from some people and they just back and forth and they just never really decide. He says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And then he says this, 
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Stated by a man, Joshua. Now, Joshua's an unusual man. Think about Joshua. Forty years, basically in slavery in Egypt. Forty years wandering in the wilderness. Thirty years conquering Canaan. Now consider something else. Think about Mrs. Joshua. Forty years, basically a slave in Egypt. Forty years wandering in the wilderness of Canaan, or trying to get to Canaan. And then 30 years waiting on her husband, going back and forth, trying to conquer Canaan. My heart goes out to her. Amen. When I read Baptist history and I get thinking about the women and some of the things that they did, raising big old families and keeping all those gardens going while their Baptist preacher husbands without preaching weeks and sometimes months at a time, good night. But there's going to be some rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Go to some people whose names we never heard. Right. But having said that, for whatever reason, the Lord puts the responsibility on the man. And it is Joshua who stands up and says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. But he's not as perfect as the Lord. Still says it. But he's ignorant. Still says it. But he's a sinner. Still says it. God knew that. God, when he wrote that verse, he didn't think, oh yeah, I forgot they're sinners. <laughs> he knew they were sinners and oh, still yeah. said it. I'm not the one who wrote that verse. Some people get mad at me like I'm the one who wrote these things. That is not my opinion on anything. I can give you a hundred cases where I think it would be a bad idea. But God said, do that. And he outranks me. Titus 2.5. Teach the women to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. How submissive people are is connected to whether or not the word of God is blasphemed. It's a bigger deal than whether or not you feel like it that day. The testimony of the word of God is on the line. I don't understand that. I can't logically explain it to you, but I can read some pretty simple statements in Scripture. So he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, stated by a man. In my experience, I haven't done a scientific study on this, but in my experience, when a man means business for God and starts leading his family for God, they tend to follow him. Not perfectly, but they tend to. Usually, when you have a family falling apart, again, I can't say every single case, but usually when you have a family falling apart, the man was not leading. Now, sometimes it was the lack of submission from the followers. That, that is a factor, but that is not in the majority of cases I have seen. So it should be stated by the man. Now, it is imposed upon his family. God Almighty intends it to be that way. Genesis 18, verse 19, when God promised all that blessing to Abraham, he says these words. He says, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. When he says, I'm going to let my secrets be known by Abraham, He's my friend. Me and him are close. He, he, this is the reason. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. You can't make adults do something they don't want to do. Amen. But you can give the command. And there are too many people that aren't even giving the command. Now, if they disobey it, that's between them and the Lord if they're an adult. But you still need to give the command. It says here, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I'll say one other thing about it as we close, and that's this. He says it publicly. He says it publicly. He says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And everybody heard it. So if they don't obey him, they're disobeying something that everybody knows they were told to do. 
Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved if thou shalt what? Confess with thy mouth. It's a good thing to say it out loud. Amen. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Luke 12, 8. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angel to God. What you mean to do for God, don't go bragging about it. Don't say it a hundred times. But you should say it out loud once or twice so people know your intention. We live in a day of ambiguity. Oh, you don't yeah. know what somebody's trying to do. <laughs> Listen, I believe that should be in every part of your life. When you mean business about serving God, you are to tell a church you want to join them because you mean business about serving God. When you join a company, you ought to say, hey, I'm a company man, I'm devoted, this company's been good to me, and I want to be good to it, and I'm going to help us, because I think this is good for us. You ought to make a state. Listen, if you start dating somebody, you should make your intentions clear as to what you're doing. I mean, whatever you're doing, it should be said and stated. Again, not a hundred times to brag about it, but once or twice, so it's clear. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. All right, I want to say this in closing. I want to be, first of all, in a good relationship with the Lord. I want to be, secondly, in a good relationship with my family. Third, I want to be faithful to God's church. Then I want to be a, cit a good citizen to my town and my state and my nation, even though some might count me an enemy for preaching God's condemnation of their sins. I don't mean it as a condemnation of their sins. I just mean it to preach what God says. But believe me, people will take it that way. I assure you. I want to ask you this. Have you considered my command tonight to fear God and put away the false gods and serve the Lord sincerely? If you haven't already done so, it'd be a real good thing for you to surrender to that tonight. The alternative is to neglect the true God and by your natural tendency serve a false God. So who are you serving tonight? Your Heavenly Father, I thank you for this.